presentation on. Thanks, Simon. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And uh, a big welcome to everyone. Thank you for coming to this session. Software supply chain risks, are we forever doomed? My name is Simon Maple. And just uh, as a bit of background to myself, uh, my background is very heavily in the engineering space. So uh, I've been in engineering teams, DevRel teams, development teams for just over 20 years. Uh, I've been at Sneak for uh, just over four years. And my role at Sneak has varied from uh, leading the DevRel and community team to now uh, the field CTO. Uh, I work with a lot of our customers, a lot of prospects as well, uh, helping them be successful with their security programs. And one of the big topics that we talk about today is, is supply chain security. And we're going to be talking about supply chain risk. Um, my background is heavily Java and heavily community oriented. So I really, really enjoy going to a lot of conferences and communities and user groups uh, to talk with uh, practitioners as well as, uh, as well as these days, a lot more uh, uh, senior execs in, in organizations. So um, what are we going to be talking about uh, today? Well, you're obviously here because you care about software um, and hopefully you care about the security of that software. And one of the areas that we're specifically going to uh, look at here today is going to be the open source software that you're using. And uh, there are a few ways in which we can look at uh, supply chain security. Um, at Sneak, the way we look at it is there are three main aspects of supply chain security. One is the components, the constituent pieces that you go ahead and use, you pull into your build environment and you deliver either as part of your application, as part of the cloud native foundation that, that, that your application runs on. Um, the second piece is around the pipeline, the going from a Git repository all the way through to a build server, all the way through to maybe an artifact repository to production, that process of pushing code through a pipeline. And the third piece that we look at as a supply chain uh, security issue are the plugins, uh, the additional components that you use as part of that CI process. Uh, so for example, CodeCov uh, could be something which obviously recently uh, attacked a, a, in a supply chain attack, something which we would bring into our supply chain into a CI style environment, uh, and it's a third party uh, artifact. Now, of course, one of the big areas there is the fact that some of these uh, pipelines have pipelines themselves. So an open source open source library has its own pipeline. And if that got attacked and breached, then it could affect the pipeline that, uh, that I am building for my application. This is one of the things that we call a cascading attack. Now, the area that we're going to be focusing on here mostly is going to be open source software supply chain. Now, this impacts us all. And one of the, um, I, want, I want to kind of like, you know, reflect on this picture just for a moment. And I'm gonna ask you, you know, when you look at this photograph, I wonder what I wonder what comes to your mind. Maybe, maybe you see this as a, an amazing futuristic outlook of, of the world, the future of our education, uh, of learning, online learning. Maybe it's the uprising of our robot overlords. Now, for me, I ask myself a couple of things. First of all, how much is this robot learning about the environment that it's in, learning about my house, my children, potentially. Where is the information that this robot is, is, is you know, gaining? Where is that being stored? Is it being stored in a safe place? Do I know where it's being stored? What if the robot gets updates from a specific place, an upsource stream, that, that, that upstream source, rather, is compromised? What happens then? What happens if it were to get compromised? Could it talk to my child? Could it recognize, could it, you know, could the baddies see where, you know, areas of my house that I wouldn't want them to see? These are, these are some of the things that when we think about it from this kind of, you know, a, a different level, an emotional level here, when it's our family or our children, it's something that would keep us up at night. We need to think about the similar risks, the same kind of things as if, you know, in our, in our applications, uh, uh, you know about this and although it's a it's a different level here when you're thinking about a family versus your application we need to really think about where we're getting these uh libraries and components from are they safe are they potentially going to it, it, you know risk or, or harm or impact my application so um, today, we're going to share with you a number of real world stories um we're going to cover 
first of all, how developers are actually core to playing this fundamental role in, in a number of recent and, and growing security incidents. We're going to cover why you should really care and think about um, the, the software supply chain security and why it's important to you and leave you really asking that question, where should you put your trust? So let's go back in time um, and let's take a, a, an early glimpse as to how one uh, developer many, many years ago, back in 1894, I believe, um, a, a Turing Award winner, Ken Thompson, he wrote a, a short essay here um, titled uh, Reflections on, on Trusting Trust. And he describes in this, in this essay how he added a backdoor into the, into the login program of Unix. Um, and when he did this, he continued and actually added a backdoor into the C compiler and go, went further in, in this almost like a chain of attack, I guess, by backdooring the compiler that compiled the compiler. And in this, in this article, he, he explores this revelation of how software can be taught um, to learn specific traits and pass them onto the spawns of, their, of software. And what you effectively do is you provide software here that can be that can remain without a trace of a ho or Trojan horse, as he calls it in here, um, because you're trusting code that wasn't uh, created, wasn't written um, by ourselves. And, and this is something which kind of goes from application code all the way to the compiler, to the assembler, to the CPU and so forth. It goes back all the all the way through about how much we actually how much we actually trust. And. As we as we learn, you know, by Thompson's Trojan horse story, which date, dates back almost 40 years, developers have been targeted as a, a malware distribution vehicle. And we'll, we'll cover that uh, with some of the more recent events. In case you had a doubt, um, we're seeing more and more open source software being being developed. And this is uh, the number of new packages which are being created in each ecosystem uh, each year. And, and you can see the growth in the number of packages being, being, uh, being added each year. Um, this is growing the open source application software uh, footprint, but the applications that we're building are also growing in their reliance, the number of open source libraries that, 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 that we pull in. And us as software engineers are very accustomed to the way that you know, people contribute. And many of us are maintainers, of course, as well to many open source libraries, I'm sure. Uh, now, how much do we know about packages that we use? How much do we know about the authors? Uh, and, and what quality uh, are, are those authors providing? A great example, in fact, it was a couple of years ago when NPM, uh, the NPM repository, they jumped up to a million packages uh, on, on their registry. And someone on Twitter claimed that they were the owner of that millionth package. And I thought, how do you know that? Because the, 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 at the time, the npmjs.com website jumped 50 packages at a time and didn't really give you a very accurate number. So you couldn't tell from that. And when you registered your library, it didn't give you a number back. So how did this person know that they had the one millionth package? So I reached out on Twitter and I said, how do you know this claim? And he said, well, when, when the NPM website was around, I think it was about 50 or so uh, packages away from the one millionth, he wrote a script to automatically create and deploy 60 packages into NPM. And that's how he knew, and he very, very likely did, get the millionth package. And this state, this is a story really about the quality of packages that can get into these repositories that we can potentially use either directly or in a dependency graph. So we have to be very, very uh, mindful of that. So when we think about the, not just the libraries, the number of libraries that are, uh, that are, are, are being added into these repositories, but the, the baggage that comes with that, the number of vulnerabilities, we can see that the numbers uh, of, of issues, known issues that are being added are growing year on year. This is the number of disclosures happening per year, a couple of years out of date here, but you, know, you can see the trend uh, really, really increasing uh, largely across all, uh, across all uh, repositories. Now, where are the fears in these repositories? Now, there's an academic paper that was published a couple of years ago that investigated the properties of various language-based ecosystem libraries. And it found that almost two thirds, 61 percent of open source packages on the NPM ecosystem could be considered abandoned. And what this meant was there wasn't a release uh, made on that NPM package for the last 12 months. And you can see that the number of packages here 
uh, number of downloads per, I think it's per week here, um, huge, huge numbers of, of downloads, hundreds of millions of downloads per, per week on what we would consider here based on the number of uh, releases per year, an abandoned package. Now, what, what is the risk of an abandoned package on NPM? Well, here's an example just from last year. Um, now, this was August of last year. Andrew Sampson, an author, a, a library maintainer, um, noticed that NPM indefinitely suspended their process for adopting an abandoned package. And remember, there are two thirds of the libraries that are abandoned. Um, and that was because of something that happened with him. Let's give you the story. Uh, he created a library or, or, or a developer uh, application called Bebop, and he wanted to register that on as many of the package registries as he could. So he looked around and, and he was able to find the Bebop name clear on Nougat, Cargo, all, all the others, apart from NPM where it was taken. So he did some investigation to understand how he could actually get the Bebop package. And he noticed that there was some documentation that said, if you can get the author's email, just using the NPM owner uh, LS uh, with package name, grab the author's uh, um, email address, CC support at NPMJS. And if there's no resolution between you and them, the NPM team will sort it out if, there's, if they consider it abandoned as well. Well, that's exactly what Andrew did. And he noticed that four weeks later, he got a reply from NPM. There was nothing back from the maintainer. And this is a little bit small, so I'm happy to read this out. It, it was basically the Bebop package was given to Andrew. Um, and um, there was a couple of caveats here. You won't be able to, there was, a, there was a thing that said, you won't be able to reuse any existing version numbers that were used by the previous order uh, author. But, in, but um, the suggestion, and it's only a suggestion, was to publish the first update as a major release. So Andrew was now given this, including you know all, all the previous releases here and he was suggested that the first release should be a major release why well because obviously it's going to be a different project um if andrew was of course malicious here he could actually add a malicious update into this package just changing it slightly and then any consumers of this uh, package could potentially pull in uh, malicious code well as NPM already mentioned, they believe this is a, an abandoned package, or is it? Well, there was another user called ZK here who published it eight years ago and only realized that it wasn't their package anymore because when they tried to do a publish, it was denied. And in fact, it says here that this was actually a dependency in over 30 different packages on NPM. Um, so this was you know, a very, very dangerous move to occur, which is why this abandoned uh, package adoption was removed. But there are other ways in which this kind of thing can quite easily happen, one of which was the event stream incident. Now, the event stream incident, um, this was, you know, back in 2018, but this was one of the one of the most targeted attacks, malicious attacks in the JavaScript ecosystem that I think it's pretty much ever seen. And this is um, targeting maintainers and targeting developers who are working in an open source uh, uh, in, uh, uh, project. And they are the uh, attack vehicle here to distribute the, the JavaScript code. So what happened was, let's go into what exactly happened here. Back in 20, uh, 2011, the event stream uh, package was created and it didn't really didn't really get received many many updates from around 2015 on so it was largely in a maintenance mode one of user antonio uh, macias Macias, uh published a non-malicious package so another package called flat map stream to npm and what they also did was they they created a pull request to this uh, event stream package, the original event stream package, that that added a dependency to their flat map stream package, which at the time was non-malicious. So they, as a as a potential contributor, as a potential open source uh, contributor, created a pull request. Probably had some good things in it, and they also added this this dependency to something that's not malicious. How was the user supposed to look at this and say, "Oh yeah, this is someone who I just can't trust at all"? They're naturally going to look at this and say, "Oh, you're trying to fix a bug. Oh, you're trying to add some feature. You're obviously a user of this, and you want to contribute back." This is the model that open source open source plays. So they accepted that, and all was good. However, 
the infected version or an infected version of flat map stream 1.0.1.1 uh, .1 was released. So this was this Antonio person um, upgrading or, 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 or uh, releasing a new version of the flat map stream to NPM. The very next build of event stream will of course pick up the, uh, the malicious version. So there was no change needed at this point to, to, to event stream because it was picking up the latest version of flat map stream. So what happened? Well, what this did was it the, the, the malicious version um, added a added a code payload uh, that was that was actually encrypted, and there was a very specific string that needed that was needed to decrypt uh, that that payload, and I think it was actually the name of the the application that it was used in, which in this case was Copay, I believe, and Copay is a is a Bitcoin wallet, and that Bitcoin wallet was consuming event stream uh, for I think two versions and it went unnoticed for three months. So this Bitcoin wallet, it's a very targeted attack to cope to the copay wallet. And this malicious attack on, on Bitcoin wallets uh, was achieved um, by, this, uh, by this update. So a very, very dangerous uh, incident that occurred there. Um, now, this could never happen again, right? We would always learn from this and the same thing would happen. Well, actually, one year later, the exact same thing happened. This time, um, an existing version of the Electron Native Notify uh, application or project uh, had no malware in it at all at version 115. And a user added it to a, a package, uh, a, a commonly used package here, EasyDex GUI. Um, no problem there at all. However, when version 116 was released at a malicious level uh, of the Electron Native Notify, uh, EasyDex GUI pulled that in. And again, it was a crypto wallet. The Agama crypto wallet was built with that uh, and included the malware. And it's ultimately exactly the same as the previous uh, as the previous example that we just shared. So what is the point here? Well, we can't just rely on our own internal dev teams here. We are relying on every developer, every maintainer to maintain the security level that we need for our application. It's not just um, the reliance on our developers to pick a good library. It's also the maintenance of those libraries by the library maintainers themselves. And it's an extremely hard thing uh, to be able to uh, to be able to track. Um, so let's move on to developer tooling. Um, how much thought are we giving to the security of our own development infrastructure, to the tools that our developers are using to build their own applications as well? This could be anything from staging environments, build tools, maybe our CI tooling. Um, one thing could be our IDEs. And in early 2021, a security, a security researcher was able to break into the VS Code GitHub repository, um, and it provided them the capability of making code modifications to this extremely well used uh, IDE that I don't know how many developers use, but I would guess it's in the millions. Now, first of all, how did this, how did this, how was this even found? Well, it, it was actually a, a security researcher riding a train. And while some of us might grab a book, check our mail, no, this person decided to uh, decided to you know scan. Uh, they were bored, it says. So they, they decided to read the VS Code code on the, on the GitHub repository, of course, as you do. And what they found is that there was a command injection flaw that was made possible because of a, 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 a an attack vector in a flawed regular expression. And they were able to, the result of this was to open a new pull request. Uh, oh, sorry, simply by opening a new pull request, the researcher was able to uh, execute code that the, that the VS Code CI scripts uh, were running. And there was no authorization, no auth authentication checks. Uh, and what they were able to do by, um, by executing code on the CI scripts and the CI servers was effectively get a reverse, a reverse shell. And they were able to get a reverse shell on the CI server. From there, they could get push access, they could get write access to the repository source code. Uh, but of course, fortunately, this was a security researcher that could that that responsibly uh, reported this to Microsoft to fix it. Uh, but yeah, in this case, we were very, very lucky that that this was the kind of thing that was uh, identified by them. So let's take a look at open source uh, security in general now um, and talk about how 
um, the Python and JavaScript communities can mitigate security issues. Now, there was a group of security researchers that investigated how their maintainers work in an open source community. And this was really in regards to their ability to, um, to not just find, but actually mitigate security vulnerabilities in a timely manner. One of the research questions was how quickly each of the maintainers in JavaScript and Python could mitigate a newly disclosed vulnerability. And this provided some really interesting stats, particularly over, you know, if you look, if you look back and further in time, the research found that uh, on average, it takes around 100 days for both JavaScript and Python uh, maintainers to start mitigating public vulnerabilities. Now, as a consumer, this may well not be anywhere near uh, quick enough. But one thing that's that's actually quite interesting to to, to monitor here is um, how, you know the, the the difference I guess in um, in vulnerability vulnerability mitigation uh, versus regular lines of code changes uh, per year. So what this graph is showing is the number of commits. Um, it, that a uh, that that our mitigation uh, for a vulnerability over the number of commits in general. So for regular uh, feature editions uh, and bug fixes and other things, and you can see here that in the JavaScript community, uh, the number of vulnerability fixes, vulnerability mitigations were very, very low up until around 2018, where it became actually a much more uh, mature thing for for, for JavaScript. Uh, maintainers to do. However, in the Python community, uh, it's fairly consistent over time. So this demonstrates the almost the low levels of AppSec awareness around the JavaScript community there um, before 2018, which is uh, which is very interesting. And now we're going to go to a very specific example here, and we're going to talk about uh, a, a, a npm library called Marked. And Marked is a Markdown parser. It was downloaded millions of times uh, every week. Um, it's a very, very popular library in the NPM ecosystem. And this vulnerability was, uh, was added. Uh, it's a vulnerability which provides the ability for some cross-site scripting um, with HTML entities. So there's a, a, the ability to add some cross-site scripting, uh, a cross-site scripting attack um, in a, an HTML entity. And an HTML entity is a representation uh, of a, a various character in HTML. We'll show you this. Uh, in fact, if I uh, show you the live hack now, I have a I have an application here. In fact, let me just uh, move this uh, up a tiny bit so you can see this application. Uh, right. So we have this application here, Goof To Do application, which is running on my local machine uh, in a Docker container. It's a to do application, so I can do things like uh, let's buy some milk, for example, and you can see that there. Now, to do a cross-site scripting attack, what I might try to do is maybe embed a embed some kind of a, a script. So maybe I'll I'll do I'll try and do a script here with maybe an alert uh, of alert one or something along those lines. Um, if I was to try and do that, this is actually getting sanitized. The marked library has sanitization, which is identifying where I'm trying to do a cross-site scripting attack, and it's recognizing the angled brackets. And trying to trying to stop that, but is this actually going through marked or the markdown? Because this is actually there's no markdown here. So maybe if I could try something, uh, maybe a bit more markdown. So if I was to do something like I don't know HTTPS uh, sneak.io, or rather this should be sneak followed by a link. Uh, this is a way in markdown that we can provide a link. So if I was to do that again, um, but this time I'll add a bad link. And instead of, let me make this a touch bigger, instead of uh, adding an HTTP uh, request here, I'm going to do a JavaScript request. Uh, and I can do a very similar thing like this. This should take us down a markdown uh, route. You're going through the, the, the markdown library to parse this. Let's see if we can uh, do that. Well, the library is actually doing sanitization itself, and you can see it's sanitizing that out and making sure that that doesn't that doesn't uh, run as we would expect. And the reason is because it is identifying some some certain characters which it doesn't like. So what we can do is 
if it's an HTML entity issue, I can add an HTML entity, a representation of these characters. So that there is the HTML entity for a colon. And I'm also going to do uh, an ampersand pound uh, 40 colon uh, for the open bracket. And I'm going to do the close bracket as well as another entity. So we've got lots of HTML entities. This is almost like a, a decoding or an encoding way of representing these characters. Now, I'm going to try and run that, see if that gets me through as this kind of an issue. And it still doesn't. Um, in fact, if I open this up, you'll see, in fact, it's actually, rep it's actually turning them back into the, the correct characters. So we're almost there. But the problem here is what happens if I almost provide an HTML entity. Uh, if I was to type in this just there, what this is doing is it's avoiding the sanitization of uh, the marked library because we're not providing an actual uh, colon here because we're missing the semicolon at the end. So this isn't an HTML entity anymore. And as this gets passed through the marked library, it's going to it's going to sit in a in a in a form that is actually now representative by the browser as a colon. So the browser will look at this in the same way it does a close anchor or a close div, etc., and say this looks like. A, uh, a colon. And when I run that, then we have the bad link, which when I run, uh, if I move that up slightly, you can see we get our alert. This is the this is the attack um, that uh, that this marked uh, library was showing. And if I jump back to my slides, uh, let's go into what I want to show you here, which is the date this attack was reported. So there's a little bit of live hacking just to show you what this uh, what this issue is. This was the date it was reported on May 20th, 2015. When was it actually fixed? Well, it was only merged and made available uh, on the 29th of July, 2016, over a year uh, later. Now, this reporter created a pull request with the fix, with information about how you can actually uh, attack, plus the tests that accompany uh, the fix as well. All it needed to, to 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 be done is to merge. But you know this isn't that this isn't the issue with the maintainer. Maintainers are just trying to do their best. This is one of the problems of open source maintenance and open and the open source model. They can't be there all the time. There's no legal or contracting obligations for them to support you unless, of course, you do that explicitly. Um, now the other the other thing about this is when a fix does go in. What happens? How long does it take you to become aware? How fast can you consume uh, that fix? So let's now go on to the actual maintainers of open source libraries. We're all very much dependent on these and we're, we're, we're reliant on the hygiene of our maintainers. I'm sure in all of your organizations and companies, you put high levels of, uh, of accountability to your staff, your, your you know, individuals all the way through not just developers but everyone in your organization to make sure that you have good passwords that you have two-factor authentication and, and other things we can't ignore the question of how we put trust in the libraries we use unless we also ask the question about uh, their their um how easy it is to to compromise them what is the hygiene levels there now, in 2017, there's a security researcher that worked with the Node Foundation to conduct some research into, into understanding the, the state, the, the assess the state of weak MPM credentials uh, in the ecosystem uh, by maintainers. And there was their, their, their work actually was pretty devastating in revealing the truth of the lack of security hygiene. What they were able to do was gain publish access. They were able to gain publish access to 14% of NPM ecosystem modules. So for 14% of ecosystem modules, the, 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 you know, these researchers were able to gather publish access. This is huge. This is, this is mind blowing. Um, these modules are downloaded tens of millions of times a week. Look at them, debug, MS, React, COA, request, really, really commonly used uh, uh, libraries. Um, now, the problem was rooted with insecure passwords chosen by well-known maintainer accounts, literally the word password or reused uh, passwords um, that, that were, uh, you know, released, uh, um, you know, elsewhere. 
Now, what could have happened if, again, if this was a malicious person doing this rather than uh, rather than a white hat hacker? Uh, very interesting to and, and quite scary as well to, to, to think about. Um, so what can we do? Well, in 2017, NPM supported two factor authentication. Um, now, NPM has well over one and a half. I'm not sure what the number is today, probably closer to two, but well over one and a half. And over the last four, four or five years, it supported two factor authentication. What has been the uptake of the two factor authentication? Well, in 2009, only 7% of maintainers have enabled two factor authentication. By 2020, it's only gone up just over 2%. So still less than one in 10 people in NPM have two-factor authentication. And I'll let you ponder that based on perhaps the, the, the security hygiene that you run in your company or that you have to go through in your company and think about where the weakest link could be here and, and what, we can, what we can think about in, in doing about that. So in, um, in, tw in, in the year 2000 here, cyber security expert Bruce Schneider uh, said in his book, Secrets and Lies, um, that humans often represent the, the weakest link in the chain. And, and, and you know, this is, this is a reality, I think. Um, and there was also a, a, a very interesting term, which is coined um, as, as uh, Linus's law back in 1999 uh, by Eric Raymond um, in his work here, The Cathedral and the Bazaar uh, in 1999, as I said. Given enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. The idea being in open source code, any bug can be found because there are literally so many people looking at it, so many contributors. Um, let's take a look at that and see if that's actually true with open source. Well, not always, okay? It's not a sweeping statement because here there was a pseudo vulnerability. It allowed attackers to gain um, root access. Uh, and this was um, a, a security vulnerability that allowed any unprivileged user to gain that root access based off the default pseudo configuration and this has uh, this was something that lived in plain sight uh for over a decade uh, and this was one of the things that kind of when we think about you know open source just because it can't th I, things can be found things are hiding in plain sight all the time so let's talk a little bit more about um how uh, software supply chain impacts uh, impacts everyone. Well, what about open source libraries not living forever? Um, we reached a point where we kind of took open source uh, for granted somewhat, and open source registries uh, are very open in their nature and, and allow developers to push openly, as I mentioned previously. We've become very accustomed uh, to to um, you know raising an issue in a project's source code repository, asking for help asking for a feature, asking for a bug to be fixed. Um, but what happens is we tend to rely on them so much, we consider them unbreakable in the sense that they're going to exist forever. Well, what happens when a maintainer removed their library? And this is exactly what happened in 2016. Uh, a maintainer called uh, Azure uh, pulled tens of his open source uh, packages from MPS, uh, largely because of a disagreement with the ecosystem. And one was pivotal. One was, of course, as we know, um, left pad. And what this resulted in was a huge fallout, a breakage of the CI process, the install process, which relied on something like a left pad. And this incident showed us two things, two important things. First of all, the weakness of how uh, businesses fail to manage their open source uh, software. And it actually just exposed this soft spot with this reliance of needing something to be you know somewhere outside of their domain but the most important thing here is how registries didn't foresee this as a problem they weren't designed to handle uh this 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 specific situation they didn't expect anyone to 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 pull a package and entirely break it and as a result there was no defensive uh coding against it other kinds of malicious activities and assets that we can kind of track back uh, to open source ecosystems. Um, well, time after time, we find more and more malicious packages hitting the NPM ecosystem. A good portion of this is through typo squatting, uh, the idea of someone uh, publishing 
a, a library that has a very, very similar name. If something's got a couple of E's, add three E's and see if someone typos and pulls their malicious package. Uh, or it could be someone potentially planting something malicious as we talked in a nested tree. And the chances of finding uh, those are, you know, are, are significantly lower as a result. But malicious packages aren't just a thing on the JavaScript ecosystem. And we saw that uh, very recently in, in, in last year, when over 3,000 malicious libraries were published on the PyPI uh, website, or on the PyPI uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, and ultimately, this, this showed a, a new type of attack, a dependency confusion attack, where it allowed a security researcher to infiltrate large organizations like Microsoft, Apple, and so forth, by publishing new libraries uh, that were given a private library name. So, so bigger companies were publishing uh, in their internal repositories a specific name, but leaving the public name open. And when a security researcher was able to publish the same name package in a public repository, uh, these ecosystems package managers were, were prioritizing some of those and pulling uh, more of the public libraries down. This dependency confusion showed, um, showed how you can exploit this design flaw in the package manager uh, and, and ultimately the human error uh, to infiltrate those. And there are tools around, free tools around. I know Sneak uh, created a free tool here to identify where this dependency confusion can exist in your build to make sure that if you're using local uh, repository packages that the public repository also has uh, packages with those names in. Now, um, I want to kind of like uh, leave leave now with with a couple of questions uh, for you, and then we can uh, we we have some time uh, left over for some questions uh, as needed. I want to I want to kind of like leave you with the following questions in terms of in terms of obviously less or more software in the future. We as organizations are constantly building more software, constantly building more uh, more functionality. My question to you is, do you think your organization is going to be using more or less open source software? Are you going to have a greater reliance or less of a reliance uh, on that as, as uh, you know, embracing the open source movement as going forward? And the big question, which is really, really important to leave you with here, is who do you trust? Who are you willing to pull in to your application? What checks? What is the requirements? for them to show their security hygiene, for them to be able to gain your trust? Is it popularity? Is it uh, showing maintenance of their packages? Is it showing they're fixing their security issues? Is it a low number of, uh, a low number of issues uh, being raised or, or, or being fixed in a sufficient amount of time? Who do you trust and who should you trust uh, going forward? That's, uh, that's everything I had uh, for today. So there's a little bit more time uh, left for, uh, for questions. Uh, if there are any questions in the chat, uh, I'm just checking now. So I can't see any questions just yet. Um, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to... Uh, uh, to add those in. One thing I will, um, uh, what, what, oh, so, so, uh, Uh, one question in from Manny. Uh, hey, Manny. Uh, uh, I think that's the Manny Sakai I know. So, hey, Manny, good to, good to see you. Uh, do you have similar coverage uh, for Java and the JDK as you have covered for JavaScript and Python? Are you talking about uh, Sneak here? Sneak. Uh, so in terms of, uh, in ter yeah, in, term in terms of sneak as um, things like SCA, the ability to scan uh, and identify your, um, your, your projects, 
uh, and where vulnerabilities and things like that exist. Uh, yeah, absolutely. You, you'll obviously have subtle differences uh, between package managers. So if you're using, you know, Maven versus NPM, for example, uh, then the way in which your dependency graph is created is going to be subtly different and su subtly different rules around that. But ultimately, you know, it's about creating that dependency graph, identifying where those vulnerabilities can exist in those dependency graphs, and and being able to suggest uh, those those uh, those fixes for them. Um, is that hopefully that answers that question, uh, Manny? But yes, there's absolutely the same coverage uh, for things like uh, Java, JavaScript, Python, and many many other languages, uh, uh, Go, .NET, and a, and a whole bunch of other things as well. Cool, it does. Excellent, thank you. Um, any other questions? Uh, one coming in. What was the issue with the private package names? Didn't quite follow. So the yes, the issue with the with the dependency confusion is uh, I believe the issue was, and maybe someone can correct me if this is not right, but I believe the issue was um, where uh, so some repositories preferred local package names versus uh, pr pr preferred uh, a package name locally. Uh, some preferred uh, remotely. So what it did was, if you used to have a pr a package name uh, that you had locally um, and there was no remote um you know in the npm ecosystem no remote uh, eco uh package name uh, which had the same package name there was no there was no uh conflict it would, it would automatically pick the one where it, it could find it but if there were two uh in the, the in the python ecosystem uh, what, what it did was it preferred uh it preferred going uh to the to the to the uh, the ecosystem one above above the local one. So it was a, it was a package managed default. Um, and as a result, where people only had a private repository because it was a package that they didn't want to share, um, if someone else uh, published a package name with the same name, so it could be you know private-apple-whatever, if they published that uh, on the Python uh, on the Pi API, build managers and package managers would pull that remote one uh, above the local instances. As, an, as a result, they could potentially put in malicious code into that into those public repositories, and and then that would get bundled with applications that the Microsofts and the Apples and so forth uh, were were building. Uh, good question. Good uh, point here. Let's have a look. Uh, there is a clear advantage of Golang in terms of security as per your vulnerability graph. Rust is also uh, by design way more secure uh, than JavaScript. How do uh, so in that sense uh, with you, uh, as per your vulnerability graph, is that because um, are you saying that uh, Serhat because uh, it won't always go for the latest version but actually stays on the on the lowest version in a dependency range is that is that why you're saying that? And the question here is how do we how uh, do you see we replace JavaScript with uh, with Wasm etc. Uh, Go Rust target Wasm. It's a you know it's a really good question and I think I actually think there's a lot more that that ecosystems um, can do to actually protect us and some of the some of the examples here go to show that I think there's other um, things like digital signing. For example, which some ecosystems uh, do, some don't. Java, for example, is in a very good state with that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you can't just upload, you know, sixty packages to 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 to, to Maven Central, for example. There need to be certain criteria met. Uh, equally, there's digital signing there that occurs. Uh, I think it's mandatory. Whereas in NPM, that's not something uh, that occurs. So I think. I, I think, you know, I, I don't want to see necessarily things being replaced or anything like that, but I think these kind of ecosystems do need to step up. Um, and, and yeah, you know, I think I think in, in Golang, I think I think what you're referring to there in terms of the dependency, the vulnerability graph is really that um, in, in JavaScript, you're much more likely to, to, you know, jump to the latest version rather than stay on your current version. And that has advantages and disadvantages. Um, you know, one might argue that it's actually, it can be considered a security advantage there because you're automatically consuming bug fixes, including security fixes. Uh, but equally, yes, from a from a uh, stability point of view, what you build in a year, uh, from what I understand, I'm, I'm not a Golang developer, but what I understand is, uh, yeah, you're going to effectively build the same artifact, even if other uh, versions have appeared. And that's, that's a really fine balance in terms of what people want to do. Do you want to stay on the latest version with bug fixes and security fixes, uh, do, or do you want to stay more stable and, and more predictable uh, with your with your version? So I think, yeah, on that one, there's a people have different um, 
uh, different ways about about going going with that. Uh, we have a few minutes left. If there's any other questions, I'm happy to uh, happy to take them. Oh, and one of the one of the things that I'm I, I was. Um, one of the things that I always think th th this session is talking about supply chain risk, but one of the things that I want to also make a distinction between is what a supply chain risk is and what a supply chain attack is, because the two are very, very, uh, are very different. And when we think about, I'll ask the question, you don't need to answer uh, on the Q&A, but if I was to say log for j to you, do you think that's a supply chain attack or do you think that's a supply chain risk? interesting or, or log for shell rather <laughs> i mean it's just a logger right but uh the interesting interesting difference there now what i would say is that is a supply chain risk in the sense that it is a library that is in our supply chain that we are pulling in to construct our application it is not a supply chain attack because who is the attacker the attacker is the person who is potentially trying to break in to someone else's app OK, so the attacker is the person who is trying to attack a website which is using Log4j. That's not a supply chain, right? They're attacking an application. Now, if someone, if you were to look at the typo spotting uh, attacks, if you were to look at um, the event stream, which is a malicious attack on a library with the intent of breaking some, of getting into someone's supply chain, that is a supply chain attack. The attacker is trying to uh, break someone's supply chain, trying to attack someone's supply chain. CodeCov, another one whereby the attacker is trying to infiltrate CodeCov because CodeCov is used in everyone else's supply chains. What do they get? They, they get given the environment variables and other things from anyone who uses a, a malicious version of CodeCov. These are, that is a supply chain attack. The others are supply chain risks, log4j, all that, those kind of things. The marked library, it's a supply chain risk, which uh, allows, you know, anything that you pull into your application could contain risk. And it's part of your supply chain. But that's different to a supply chain attack. Just one thing that I wanted to kind of uh, add there. Oh, sorry, I didn't uh, I didn't scroll scroll down. Yeah, Manny, uh, Manny got that one with the supply chain risk. Um, so... Uh, 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 does sneak have features to suggest squatting and potential misspelt names in the current project? Uh, so what it does is when when we identify uh, misspelt names in your project, it'll mark it as a, a malicious project. Uh, and as a result, if you try and use that, it will be flagged as um, it'll be flagged as a, as a vulnerability using a, 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 a vulnerable or, or in this case, malicious library. Uh, is anyone working on shadow repository services to help during times uh, when a package becomes unavailable? I don't think there's anyone doing that, but I think this is actually a really good way of actually getting uh, a repository, like a private repository, and making sure that you know you have uh, those as well. It's an, and it's about your business and your organization making sure that it's not being left up to the repository. What are you doing to make sure that you you know you are catering uh, for these incidents as well? And thank you very very much for the questions. I appreciate them. That brings us. Uh, Bang up to the uh, to the to the ten two, which I believe is uh, is the top of uh, top of this webinar. Oh well, thank you so much, Simon, and thank you everyone for participating. Questions always make these um, things much more applicable to your particular scenario, and um, we're just so happy to have you all here. And we hope to see you back at a future webinar. Thanks, everybody.